Like one guy told me, he's like, look, you can make $5 million a year. It won't matter because I'm going to work two, three, four, five years. And somebody's going to cut me a hundred, $200 million check. All right. So welcome everybody. Whoever's watching this, welcome to the Nets Fear podcast. We got a very special guest here today, Luca Nets. Welcome, my friend. I'm really happy to have you here. That's in the net sphere, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you. So, you know, a lot of people actually know who you are. It's pretty crazy how many people were requesting you to be on the podcast. I was like, man, we really got to make this happen. And I know we've been talking for a little bit, you know, back and forth on DMs and stuff. So I'm really glad to finally be here. But for those of you that don't know you, <clears throat> could you give like a quick, you know, backstory on yourself here? Yeah, I won't, I won't dive too much into it, but uh, sure. my name is Luca. I'm a self-made entrepreneur. I uh, dropped out of school when I was 16 and I pursued uh, the entrepreneurial journey. I was able to be uh, very successful in e-commerce and now I'm starting a new chapter in my life in the NFT space. So Nice. I love that it? quick elevator pitch. <clears throat> and you know, that actually, I have a question written down in regards to that because a lot of people you know, are looking at the NFT and Web3 space right now and they're like either hesitant or extremely like excited about it. So let me ask you this, what was your, what led you to this transition be from you know, the Web2 world to the Web3 world? Yeah, so I was trading NFTs uh, since last summer. So I was able to make a lot of money doing that. And as I just kind of dived into the rabbit hole and I met new people and I just started interacting and kind of realizing what was going on, I realized this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And like every 20, 25 years, something like this comes across your table where like there's a huge paradigm shift in how the world operates. And this is one of those moments with Web3. If you kind of look into it and you research it, it's, you know, kind of falls into the category of like, you know, this functions as a basic human right and you know how this works is the right way and typically as time has shown in the past that when there's moments and tools and technologies that kind of lean into you know basic human rights and you know evolve what it is to be a human and how we interact every single time they hit and they go parabolic and they do really really well and i still think we're at the cusp because the technology is so early and we haven't really you know spearheaded this in a in uh you know probably a you know 12 to 18 months in of like real awareness here right we're kind of on the forefront of something special and so i'm at that time in my life where i've made enough money you know i own two homes i have everything i could possibly have dreamed of you know looking back at it six years ago and i'm in the moment now where i want to make real money like i don't want to make you know millions of dollars a year which you know for those of you guys listening, it sounds great when you're not there, but once you get there, it's it's a little lackluster. And I believe my career is greater than just the guy who knows how to make money. Like I've always felt like I'm somebody who, you know, could be really impactful. And I've always wanted to create a legacy and the opportunity presented itself where, you know, this could be my moment to really cement myself, not only as, you know, somebody who's super talented, but and knows how to make money, but somebody who's really one of the great entrepreneurs the world has ever seen. And so that's, you know, what I'm looking at conquer. I want to put my name in the history books and this is the opportunity to do it. Fuck yeah, bro. That that's amazing. Geez, that hits that explanation was amazing. And I totally see it. I mean, to be honest with you, like you've already made a mark, <laughs> even if it's like, you know, even if you don't, it's not tangible to you yet. Like, just the fact that so many people wanted to see you on here is crazy to me. Like, especially since you don't really have a ton of content out there or anything. It's just from what you've done. So that's super fucking cool. Let I me ask you it. this. I have a, another question that just kind of, I'm very, very curious about. Uh, and it kind of dives a little bit into your backstory. But when did you begin like entrepreneurial endeavors? Because you mentioned, you know, you want to be one of the best in the world, which I'm going to be really hyped to see. When did that begin for you? So I always knew like I wanted to be successful and like I never grew up with like connections or resources where I could get like high level jobs or, you know, gaps bridged before, like, you know, for me. So I always had to make the opportunities out of myself. 
from, you know, lemonade stands in middle school to uh, selling weed in high school to throwing shows and dropping out and, you know, throwing underground rap shows right after I dropped out. And then, uh, you know, I got my first job at a company called Ring, and that's what kind of showed me, like, you know, I was there when they raised their first, you know, when they, they even raised their first round, they were pretty much nothing at the time. And, you know, by the time I left, he'd sold four billion dollars. And I saw that, you know, wow. like, and so I like, I just knew, dude, like I, I, I tell people I left school because I needed to help pay the bills and get out of my situation. And that's true. But looking back at it, one of the main reasons I left school is because I couldn't stand these teachers telling me what to do. Like, I just couldn't stand it. Like, I knew I needed, I like, I needed to dictate my own future. Like, I couldn't let anybody dictate my future for me or tell me I wasn't worthy or tell me I wasn't capable. And so, like, it's always been in me. Like, it, it's a fire that's been burning. And I was always waiting when I was younger to be old enough to be taken seriously. And, you know, I still deal with some of that stuff today. And in terms of not being taken seriously by certain people, but like, I, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Like this fits my person in my personality type perfectly, like who I am as a human being and who I am as, you know, just, just who I am personally. It's like, this was written in stone for me. I, I love that. One, one of the things that I think stands out to me is it sounds like, you know, since you didn't have some of those connections early on, you had to be resourceful. And yeah. as we were kind of preparing for this podcast, I was hearing like story after story where you were resourceful, whether it was when you were throwing parties, uh, you know, for uh, in, in high school and everything was getting shut down and you're having to start it back up or whenever you first worked out a deal with Supreme Patty and you had to email the guy, what was it, like 30 times or something? Yeah. Yeah. So like, how do you feel like that resourcefulness is like played into like your entrepreneurial career? Because I feel like that has to be something that's massive. Dude, it's one of my biggest pros and it's just like the inability to like, I, if I want something, I'm going to go take it. Like, I'm not going to let, like, unless you give me a hard no, like I'm going to keep battling against the grain. And like, I'm not like this world is mine for the taking. It's not for somebody else to dictate like how I'm going to succeed or how I'm going to fail. Like those choices will be mine and ultimately mine. I think one of my greatest strong suits is the ability to deal with stress and like, you know, rejection, like that stuff doesn't phase me. Sure. I get anxiety and sure things bother me, but I like, I push through it, you know, like I'm not here to fail. I'm here to win and sure I've had failures, but I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm past that. Like I, I know exactly what to do and how to do it. And I know exactly how to succeed. And so as long as, you know, the universe and I are aligned and, and I'm still breathing and still kicking, like I'm going to get there. Is there a moment where when you look back, you kind of realize that you were resourceful or is there a moment that you like, were like, oh, this is my strong suit? Because obviously you have that self-awareness now, but looking back, were you, did you ever realize there was a moment you could lean into it? Yeah, I think like resourcefulness is just something like, dude, we grew up, like I lived in probably 30 different places, you know? So like being resourceful was like, you know, like you had to do that when you're just bouncing around home to home and staying on people's couches. So you got to make the best of it in, in some capacity. I think the real turning moment for me was like, I got beat down so much growing up that like my stress tolerance is like through the roof. Like there's, there's moments and things that I could show you or tell you guys about that I don't want to dive into where I've lost so much money or so many bad things have happened to me back to back to back. And I just like remain unfazed. Like that to me is probably my greatest skill set. A lot of people fail because something goes wrong and they get crumbled and they get crushed on the pressure oh my God, this happened to me, I'm done, you know, resort to what's easy. Uh, but, you know, for me, like, I'm just like, my skin is so thick now that like, there's very few things that you could do to me or that could happen that will really phase me and throw me off track. That's, that's awesome. That's powerful, bro. Building that thick skin is, that's definitely got to play a huge role in like the success of even some of like the greatest entrepreneurs in the world. So like you said, um, you're kind of reflecting those qualities already, which is just so dope. I want to ask you something, you know, related to, I guess, becoming this like incredible entrepreneur that you already are, but you want to continue to grow. Obviously, I'm sure a huge role was bringing in the right people and working with the right people. So how do you find the right people? Yeah, so I think this uh, kind of just leans into building your personal brand. So growing up when I first became an entrepreneur and like, you know, personal brand was sitting in front of a nice car and, and flexing and, you know, driving, <laughs> you know, renting a jet from LA to Vegas and standing in front of the jet, like you just own the thing. 
Like yeah. that is what a lot of people's interpretation of a personal brand is. And that's not the case at all. A personal brand is expressing to the world who you are and showing them your personality. And eventually, depending on your personality type, you'll attract other people with similar personality types. Right. One of the best things that I did was, you know, just start posting, you know, my accomplishments and just who I am as a person on my social medias. I've since kind of stopped that, but there was a time where I was really, you know, leaning into that hard. And eventually like-minded individuals just begin to migrate. And so what I don't recommend is when you're on the come up, like don't be hiding your wins and don't be hiding your developments, whether they're, you know, financial developments or personal developments, share your journey to the world, share your process to the world, because nobody's going to know who you are and nobody's going to want to work with you. If there's nothing, if there's no guideline or no content that they can reference and see who you are, probably the most impactful thing for my career was that first God Hilsey podcast. You know, it was probably me posting Shopify screenshots of insane revenue days and that Scott Hilsey podcast because people finally like put some respect on my name and like I didn't, you know, like really like knew who I was. And then from there, the floodgates open. So like doing the best you can to get into the right channels to, you know, tell your story and, you know, a story is something you shouldn't be ashamed of, own it. Uh, and really just like, you know, let people know who you are. And eventually the like-minded individuals will migrate. And fortunately for me, the like-minded individuals were talented and are talented and they continue to migrate in my direction. And I try my best to utilize their talents uh, for the greater good. And sometimes we work together, sometimes we don't, but you know, the mutual respect always lies. I love that. So right now, how, how big is your team? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, so right now, my main objective right now is Pudgy Penguin. So I had a huge team when I was like, you know, doing a bunch of different businesses and like mm -hmm. kind of you know, my models. I've always been the guy who likes to own, you know, 15 to 30 percent of a business. I never wanted to be the core operational guy. I like to lean into my strong suit, which is marketing. My main endeavor now is Pudgy Penguins and I'm all in. I'm not doing anything else. And I've recently stepped down from my role as CMO and Gel Blaster and uh, a couple other roles of companies that I was a part of in, in the in the marketing department, and you know, right now the Pudgy Penguin team is about twenty one people. Uh, so yeah, that's awesome. So with Pudgy Penguins, obviously, you guys have to do marketing and grow the name and everything like that in order to you know grow the brand. How does the marketing differ from Web three versus just the previous things that you've done? Yeah, so usually when I market, there's a direct ROAS, right? Sell a gel blaster cost me X, sell it for X. I have this much in the middle to make money on. My CAC has to be this. Pudgy Penguins is interesting because it's an IP company. It's a brand awareness company. So there really is no intrinsic ROAS. Uh, though you do, are selling products and whatever, I think the ROAS really comes from the CAC on the follower and what that stuff looks like. It's a different, it's a different approach because it's a brand awareness approach when you're kind of like bootstrapping a startup but there's really no measurable ROAS yet that you can kind of gauge. So it's kind of like a, a mental ROAS where you're kind of like, oh, I did this, you know, we, we did, you know, 20 sales a day that would equate to, you know, three Ethereum, you know, okay. Three Ethereum is 15, you know, five grand, you know what I mean? At these prices and you kind of move accordingly. It's definitely a little more complex because it's, it's harder to forecast and it's harder to budget around. I think is the issue, but that's why I'm really leaning into making it more of a ROAS centric business. Like I said, it's an IP company. It's not an NFT company. It just happens to be an NFT and that's a cool vertical that we have. And we're definitely going to innovate and develop in the web three side. But like, I want to make toys. I want to make clothes. I want to make games. Like I want things that are, do have a trivial ROAS, right. And it can be quantified uh, in, a, in a pay for play model. So we're getting there. We're not quite there yet, but slowly but surely we're getting there. Dude, that's so cool. <laughs> I remember when I like first found out about you, you were like you said this like I remember you had the like Kurama, like the nine tail fox, you know, of like all these different things that you were doing. <laughs> um, so it's kind of cool to see that now you're focusing in and man, I, I know you're going to just explode through this vertical. And on also like just all these things that you're mentioning, like all these companies that are getting into the NFT space and like Web3, I mean they're going to be way behind by the time you're already like a year deep and have figured all this shit out. I'm figuring some shit out right now, dude. That's right now. My main priority is getting money because I spent basically two and a half million dollars buying it. Another 500 grand funding the treasury. 
But I need, you know, when you're competing with guys with 700, 800, you know, $300 million in the bank, it's tough. Uh, though I think I can spend it way more efficiently than anyone else can. My main priority is getting the money to kind of get that first mover advantage because I've cracked some codes, dude, that like when I tell the story about this, like a couple of years from now, whenever that time comes, like there's some mind blowing things that I've learned. Like if this thing failed tomorrow, it was worth every penny. You know, like the things that I have learned, like I've evolved so much in these last hundred days as an entrepreneur like my sauce is so much more nasty than it was. Like my playbook for the last couple of years was pretty simple. You know, put people in places that can do things that I don't know how to do or I don't like knowing how to do. You know, ad buying, which isn't rocket science. You know, it's really product market fit and finding, you know, a winning product. Mm -hmm. uh, and then outsourcing and doing as little work as possible while, you know, retaining a high profit margin and bridging gaps that were, you know, are hard for the average person to bridge. That's really kind of was my model for the longest time. I also have a really interesting playbook when it comes to seating and like I have a formula on how to move like clothes and toys. Like I kind of cracked the code in that regard. But dude, this thing has opened up my playbook in a whole different way. Like I know when we succeed here, I'll be able to succeed in anything. Like this to me is my ultimate test. It's my ultimate challenge. And I have two and a half million dollars on the line, but more importantly, I have my reputation on the line. Like this is the one I'm telling everybody that I'm gonna blow out of the water. And so far I've hit, but this one, this one will be a lot more embarrassing if I miss, right? Like Von Dutch, I told you that'd be the biggest clothing brand it was. You know what I mean? Gel Blaster, I said it would be the biggest toy and it is, you know? But like this one, I publicly went into something that was dying. I spent two and a half million dollars to buy it. And I'm basically saying it's gonna be the biggest one in the world when all the other guys have hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank account. And so if I pull this one off, it's undeniable. No one can say anything. You know, so this is this is my ultimate stamp. And, you know, if it fails, it fails. That's God's choosing. But I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that it wins. And if and when I win here, it's it's a wrap. It's GG. It, no, it's GG, dude. Game over. <laughs> <laughs> Game over. So the, I, I love the chip on the shoulder first. I think I feel like every great entrepreneur that you know has a, a chip on their shoulder that it's like, look, I'm going to make this fucking happen. So I love that. I love the mentality. So you bought Pudgy Penguins. Yeah. How did you get connected with those guys? And then what made you make the decision that you're like, okay, this is it. This is how where I'm going to go all in. Yeah. So 12 months ago, when I first got into buying NFTs, I had 50 grand and I had a choice. I said I was either going to buy Bored Apes or these new things called Pudgy Penguins. And my marketing mind initially, and this was 12 months ago, before I ever bought it, or even it was on the peripheral that I would own this. I mean, I would never have thought I would have owned this. But I knew, I texted all my friends, I said, this is going to be the biggest one. Because uh, there was something, I, I saw the positioning, and I knew which market it would attract. And I said, like, look, like this is going to be the biggest one. So I spent 50 grand on that. I ended up making a fortune off of that trade, and it ended up buying apes and a bunch of others. And that investment paid over 50 times over. But I knew since day one, since the second I saw the art, that this could be humongous. Now, unfortunately, the people who started that project at the time, they weren't operational guys. They were just young kids who never started a business before, right place, right time, right art, you know, and it took off. But, you know, slowly but surely we started to die when people realized, like, like, look, there's no real concrete leadership here. Well, I've been building brands for the last five, six years. And, you know, recently with Gel Blaster, you know, seeing the checks that Walmart and these major distributors are like cutting, you know, for POs for some of these things, I was like, oh, the toy business is interesting. Right. So now that I have like a good sense of that, like when the opportunity came to buy it, I saw a bunch of guys on Twitter making bids to purchase the project. The thing is they weren't operational guys, right? None of them have built brands. They were just like crypto whales that would probably make jokes out of the project and they would probably do well, but it wouldn't be a legacy brand. And I really felt like the IP, you know, warranted like the next Hello Kitty or the next Angry Birds or the next Pepe the Pig or the next Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like I really think I believe in this IP that much. So I ended up making a bid. Now, fortunately, I'd met a guy who knew the founder a couple of days before. So when I made the bid, he was like, dude, I'm, I'll connect you. Like, I, you know, if this is real, if you're serious about it, let's do it. And I was like, yeah, dude, I'm serious about it. Let's do it. So one thing led to another. The deal took a little bit longer because a deal like that hadn't been done before. So our lawyers kind of invented case law, which kind of took a little bit longer than I initially wanted. But, you know, that principle to me and like just the initial thought like i knew from day one 12 months ago pretty much today like probably 11 months and two weeks from today that i knew that this thing would be humongous 
And I made the choice that like, like I it had made me so much money, like trading NFTs at probably almost close to seven, eight, nine, ten million dollars that I've made. I don't know. I mean, like realized probably five million dollars realized in Ethereum, right? But like, you know, unrealized, who knows? But like it all started with the penguins. Like if the penguin investment would have flopped, like all things, if you try it and then you flop, you're like, all right, on to the next, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. This thing hit so big for me and it made me so much money that I was like, dude, like I owe responsibility. Cause like I wouldn't, I, 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 it, you know, the, the, how this whole thing came, I'm not going to give the whole pudgy penguin story. Cause we can go 20, 30 minutes just on this topic, <laughs> but there was a unique alignment on how did this all happen? Like, this is almost like God is speaking to me from heaven and saying like, yo, you need this one. And like how it all happened from where I was when it happened, being in Sedona and Arizona, which is like the spiritual vortex of the world, you know, to like, leaving there to like wanting to figure out like what my next chapter is because i knew i wanted to be something bigger dude i always wanted to be in like the tech space and though i'm not positioning this like a tech company there is technology behind it and it is attracting the tech investor i I just knew dude like there's there's something greater here and i I don't know what and if i fail i'd be i'd be shocked i'd be like okay well you just wanted to spank me in public but all right i'll take it (laughs) you know yeah like that that's what you wanted all right that's you know at some point it's greater than me but like dude like i'm just seeing how everything is working how everything is firing like the people that are coming behind us the people on this team like dude every single thing that i've done for the last five six years has led to this moment and it's really going to show me it's my ultimate challenge it's my ultimate test but like everything in life i plan on you know winning that test and i plan on persevering and coming out on top so i love wow. that you keep referring to it as like a challenge and a test do you look at entrepreneurship as like do you are you trying to just purely make money or is it just like let's go through and, and t- see what i'm capable of accomplishing i'm over the money thing you know yeah like I got at what point house. did you become over the money yeah once i once I realized how easy money was to make, like, I think this bull run recently, I was just like, dude, what? I bought some <laughs> Ethereum, I bought some Bitcoin, I bought some monkeys and some penguins and I made all this money. I made yeah. more money in the last 12 months than the last five years combined. So it's just like, dude, I'm over the money. I have the car that I've always wanted. I have the houses that I've always wanted. Like, granted, I want more, but like, dude, like building great product, like the money you're going to get from building a great product supersedes any money that you're going to get hustling and bustling. Like one guy told me, he's like, look, you can make $5 million a year, it won't matter because I'm going to work two, three, four, five years and somebody's going to cut me a hundred, two hundred million $200 million check and I'm going to make more money than you would have made in 20, 30 years hustling four or $5 million a year. And I was like, yeah, real wealth is generated when somebody cuts you a check so big that you never need to work again. I don't want to work any, like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I don't want to be 40 and working. Like, I want to be 40 and investing and advising and helping and being a philanthropist and saving the animals who are getting abused left and right. Like, I want to have, like, a real impact. Like, I, I, I'm not the hardest working person in, in the bunch, though, as of the last, this pudgy penguins, I've kicked into my, like, hard working mode again because, like, it requires it. Mm-hmm. But like, I, 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 I'm, I'm bigger than just somebody who just like works all day to like meet shareholder expectations. And like, you know, like I have a greater legacy, but th- this is the stamp, you know, this is the one that I think is going to take me to where I want to be in life. That's going to give me, you know, that's going to allow me to make the decisions that are going to dictate the rest of my life. And so like the space is so small, the upside is so high. It's not going to fail. I've seen it too many times. I've been on the forefront of these things too many times and I've missed the opportunity because I was scared or, you know, not really putting my money where my mouth is. And I just refuse. Like, this is right up my alley. This is what I do best. I've been training for this for the last five to six years. Like I am built for this. So if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but I have every plan and every expectation that it will. Yeah, bro. <clears throat> to be honest, like, I don't really know too much about, I, I know about Web3, I am, I've been invested for a while too, but just in terms of business and everything that I've studied as far as like some of the greats like Steve Jobs, Apple, Wozniak, all these people, it sounds like I'm like I'm super confident that you're gonna get there as well. So I'm I'm just hyped right now to even have you on here, bro. I'm just like, holy shit. This is <laughs> Dude, so I'm buzzing dope. right now, it's fire. Um, that's crazy so let me ask you this you're all in on pudgy penguins as far as like work are you still like investing you know because you said you, your goal is to eventually be you know not really working just managing investments 
you know, philanthropist work, advising. What are, are you doing those things still now? I'm still advising some things like there's some commitments that like, you know, I always have an hour or two a week to give a couple guys that I don't mind giving. I actually backed out on a couple of venture investments and I feel like a piece of shit. I never thought I'd like, that's totally not in my character. And I never thought I'd be that guy to back out of a venture deal, especially because like, that's like every founder's worst nightmare. Like mm -hmm. somebody's saying they're going to give you money and then they back out. I felt like a real piece of shit, but like, I'm not like the market conditions are so unique right now where it's like, I don't want to throw my money into something and get it locked up. Just hope that it gets acquired one day. Like there's opportunities right now. If I buy Coinbase stock at 50 bucks, like Coinbase stock will be worth 500 bucks one day. Dude, it's Coinbase, you know, like this thing is the future. So like, I rather have a more liquid investment and put my money there. So other than that stuff, like, you know, I'm doing a little trading stuff and managing my portfolio accordingly. Like, I think I was a little too negligent on my portfolio on the downturn. So like just learning from my mistakes and making sure that I don't repeat them. But like, dude, I am I am so invested here. Like I like I am determined to make this work because I think the bar is low, dude. Like I don't mm -hmm. think there's real operators in this space yet. Like granted, you have Board Ape and but like even then, like I think those guys are phenomenal. But like I don't think they're going to sit here and tell you that like they're brand builders. Now they may be hiring brand builders, you know, but like hiring a brand builder and being a brand builder and owning the business are two different things, you know, like you're never going to say an employee is going to work as hard as the founder. It's never going to happen. You know, like you can never, unless your, your option package is that, you know, enticing that somebody's going to work, you know, at that capacity, like you have to have stake in the game to really like push the boundaries. And I think they're so big and, and like the main top project, the projects that I'm really competing with are so big that, unless you're actually a brand builder as a founder, like the people that you're going to hire, uh, unless you're paying them millions of dollars, like I don't think it's really going to move the needle that much uh, or really have the effect. So I think I have a unique opportunity as somebody who's like got $3 million on the line to really push the boundary and like really pull my best resources uh, that I know that I have and that I know how that I can execute on to really like push this thing forward. So you were talking about the uh, verticals earlier so of course like there's the nft you were talking about toys maybe animation i don't know what other use cases there are is there anything that like really grabs your interest at this point that you're like man this is this is an open field like somebody needs to run through this yeah so the thing is a lot of these companies are treated like like ford ape you know leaning into the game hard so they're probably going to turn into a gaming company and a lot of these guys are you know picking singular value propositions and to what they lean into and I think they're totally mis misinterpreting like how to run these businesses and how to look at them. I'm looking at the business like an IP business. So like as if I own Star Wars, right? So like, I don't know if you guys know, but like Marvel and Disney and all these companies, like a majority of their revenue doesn't come from their movies or any of that stuff. It comes from licensing, right? Free so Pokemon. Pokemon's yeah, one like of the, the biggest ones. The money this comes is from licensing. <laughs> yeah, the, the money comes from licensing. So it's a free cash flow business, no risk, all reward, right? So I don't incur any of the costs. There's no risk. If it fails, it doesn't matter to me. And I just reap my percentage of the profits for you being able to use my likeness. Treating this like an influencer, like a celebrity, which as you guys know, I'm pretty good at, you know, I'm pretty tapped in into that world. Mm -hmm. So the businesses is just create the leverage, create so much brand awareness that all the top brands are coming to me with licensing deals, right? And, you know, we just signed a deal with PMI, which is the toy company, you know, that's a no risk, all reward business. You know, I make some calls to the distributors that I know, you know, have trusted me in the past and bought my products in the past. And my thing is, is to drive up brand awareness so much that once that product hits shelves, it sells. And eventually every quarter I get a check in the mail and that goes straight into my bank account and it becomes, you know, a net profit win. Didn't really cost me much. And all I do is reap the benefits and the rewards of the IP being valuable and people wanting to license the IP. Thankfully for me, I have some of the brightest licensing minds on the advisory board of our company, kind of like advising me on, you know, what the proper approach is and what are my next steps are. But, you know, that's the business that I'm in. I'm in the business of creating an IP that impacts so many people that has so many followers across all social medias that any brand would be dying to work with us. And they'd move our product and, you know, certain verticals. And I would just collect a check at the end of every quarter. And hopefully those checks become so big that, you know, we're making 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars of free cash flow. And then we build our core products and our core products. I won't allude to that in a public, you know, setting because it's got to keep my aces up my sleeve. Uh, 
But that's Fair. how you do it. And I, I just don't know how these guys are going to succeed. Like unless you're Epic Games or, you know, you're bored ape nice. and you can work with an inoperable and, you know, you can go do, you know, $800 million in the bank account. Like, yeah, okay, you can do that. Like, but that's like an anomaly, you know, like these guys are like building games, like saying keywords and like, dude, no, no go to market strategy, no idea on how they're going to get consumers. Like their value propositions are all wacky because they're just not business owners. They're not brand builders. They don't understand, you know, their first time founders or first time entrepreneurs. Unfortunately, it's going to be at, at the expense of their holders. But the point of the matter is they just don't know how to build these businesses. I've been around this rodeo enough. And, you know, if you ask me what Pudgy Penguins is, we're an IP brand and we're an IP company. And maybe one day we own multiple IPs, but it leans into my, it, this narrative leans into my strengths the best. Like my strengths is getting millions of people to see something like that is what I'm good at. That is my superpower. That is what I'm known for, you know? So like what better thing to have, you know, acute and inclusive IP that impacts people in a positive way that people can resonate with. Everyone loves penguins, you know, mm -hmm. every, Every decade has shown that there's a great penguin IP from Happy Feet to Club Penguin and the list is endless, you know? So all I've got to do is get people behind the message. The message is about mental health awareness, helping people, being a good person. If you're not aligned with that message, kick rocks and go to Andrew Tate's <laughs> Russell University. And, you know, like I, it's no, no difference to me, but the world eventually is migrating into this shift where it's like, you know, this is what matters to people. This is what impacts people. This is what creates a devout following. This is what creates, you know, people that are going to buy your product over and over and over and over again. And our branding and our positioning and our message and our art and our IP is just better than everyone else's. Damn, man. I my, love that my mind vision. is blown. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really fuck with the vision. <laughs> like I actually do. That's so cool. Yeah, just me. I, I, I kind of like sit on the outside of crypto. Like I know it's a big thing, but like I, you know, and I, I know the NFTs are obviously like really popular, but I've never heard anybody talk about crypto or an NFT or a project in this manner that it's like it is intellectual property that is then going to be used in other mediums. Yeah. I'm just I'm blown away. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's why, you know, I actually watched that interview that you did at that podcast with uh, Scott Hilsey and just to see the growth, bro, in terms of like the conversation and just everything is just unreal. Bro. Like that's what I was I'm just thinking like, the wow. same thing. I was like, thinking the same thing. So it's so cool. I feel like I watched a couple of interviews and every interview was like a year spaced out. You don't make a lot of content, man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and like the every single year, there was like a different season of Luca. Can you talk <laughs> about season. that? Like, <laughs> like what what like goes through your mind whenever you're like, okay, like I'm switching. I need to now step into a new role as a person. Yeah, it's just like the evolution of man. Like if you're not evolving and you're stagnant, then like I, if you guys told me I was the same person as Scott Hilsey podcast, it'd be a bad thing. Like I'm constantly evolving. I'm constantly learning. And like one of the biggest things is like constantly make mistakes, but I learn from all of my mistakes. And so what you're seeing is just like endless lessons, me taking from those lessons, incorporating. You're seeing a lot of trials and tribulations that are molding me, right? Like when I was when I first did the Scott Hilsey podcast, like I didn't believe in God, you know what I mean? Like I didn't believe that that was a thing, like, you know, and then like that's the second one, you see the complete flip, right? Cause I thought I was going to die. And then, you know what I mean? I realized like what really mattered in life. And this is an evolution of man, you know, like I told Scott, we're going to do five of those videos. And on the fifth one, it'll be my last checking out. And I'll probably be a little bit older. I'll probably be 35, you know what I mean? Like 30, 35. And that will be the last one. And, you know, that will be the one where I'm good for life and life is good. And we're on to, you know, the, the, the chapter has ended, you know, and then now I move on to the next thing. So like, it, it's just like, dude, an evolution. Like if you're not evolving, if you don't see real changes in yourself, like, what are you doing? You know, like you're just staying stagnant, like, you know, being in the same spot is regressing. You know what I mean? It's either it's moving forward or nothing. Like being stationary is like pointless, you know, like, mm -hmm. so for me, like, I'm not like, I'm somebody that's like, I have core values, I have integrity. And like, as I, you know, go through life, like some of these things are going to change and, you know, new lessons are going to be learned and I will adapt and adjust accordingly. And I'll, you know, eventually become the man that I know I can be. Dude, I almost feel like if you're not evolving like that, it's like against human nature almost like it's like the wheel of progress only 
rotates through every, like you know if everybody continuously evolves can i ask you something like to so we've been talking a lot about big big picture things like think big uh, a quote i heard recently was think big but act small so i want to act like ask some small little things here because i'm sure a lot of people are you know watching this and they're just getting started and they're just like man well you know i, I can't really think that big i don't really know what's going on uh, so for example with your trading let's just talk about trading like what what platform are you using nowadays um i'm using coinbase pro for my crypto and metamask for like the other crypto stuff that's no. not on coinbase and then i'm using uh e-trade td ameritrade and robin hood and i still like robin hood as my favorite one and like every real trader is going to be like you're such a noob for saying that like, <laughs> i've been on like robin hood since i was 16 you know like so yeah i mean that's that, that's that's my trading stuff sick yeah i like robin hood too it's like intuitive i mean obviously they had that whole beef with like gme and amc but putting that aside like their platform is just so simple and easy to use it removes the you know like the barrier to entry for and in, like retail investors and i like that i agree i want to touch on a, a question that we talked about the last podcast sorry both me and uh, ari answer this question i'm curious to know what your answer will be so uh since we're kind of gearing this more towards beginners um if you were starting now let's just say that you only had 50 grand uh but you had none of the responsibility that you currently have you still know everything but you have none of the responsibility. There's no, there's no uh, pudgy penguins. There's no boards. There's nothing. Uh, what would Luca build and why? You know, I think it's an easy answer because I have capital, right? Like if I have 50 grand, like today, like I would just go all in this crypto and NFT stuff, dude. Because I've just really? never, I've never seen money like this and you can go build a business and like, there's probably safer approaches, but like, it depends. Like if I'm under 30 with 50 grand, like I'm risk adverse. Like one of the things was like with pudgy penguins, it was like, dude, if I'm going to do this, I'm gonna do this now. Like, I'm not going to do this when I'm 35, when like half of my life is over, you know, like if I'm going to go and take risks, it's now. So if I'm 24, which I am today and I have 50 grand. I'm not going to go sit here and start a trucking business or, you know, something that like is really like low risk, decent reward, fiscally responsible, you know, good, smart financial decision. I mean, those opportunities are endless. Like I can do a trucking business, a ski rent, a jet ski rental. Like I can hustle a million different things to make a hundred grand a month. Like making a hundred grand a month is like really, really easy, dude. Like, you know, like if you're really going to put in the time and you have no other obligations and you have 50 grand, I mean, the opportunities are endless. But if I was like knowing what I know today and like being this exact human being with 50 grand, I would spend 12 hours a day diving into this crypto and NFT stuff and mastering the process and wash and, and you know, paper trading and really understanding it. Cause like, dude, I've seen guys turn a couple grand into 20, 30, 40 million bucks, the most insane thing you've <laughs> ever seen. And so when you look at risk reward, it's like, what are you doing this to really do? Like if you're coming in and like, me, if you're asking Luca, like I'm doing this to be worth hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, right? So like, I have no interest in making a hundred grand a year. So I think it's completely dependent on your personality type and who you are and what you do, right? My personal preference is like, I'm just not in the business of making a hundred grand a year. Like I've far superseded that. Like that's not my motivation, right? So me personally, as somebody who's like trying to really, really move the needle and like, go big or go home i just go all in crypto and nfts and just dive down that rabbit hole and you there's a high probability you'll lose all your money you know what i mean but if you do the right research and you do the right due diligence the risk reward and the probability of you making so much more money in such a faster amount of time than anything else i'd rather go that route and if i lose the 50 grand then i go get a job for six months, save the money and go start a trucking business and learn the hard way, you know, and then maybe build it up. But, you know, this might not be the best advice. Don't get me wrong. This is a, this is technically falls into the category of a fiscally irresponsible decision. It's not the right <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. but you're asking me personally. Now, if you're giving me, you're asking me the advice of like what the average Joe should do. 
well, the average Joe should probably go and build a business. You know, 50 grand is plenty of money. And where do you go? Like there's, a, there, it's a bunch. It depends on your personality types. I think people really underestimate, you know, drop servicing, right? Like middle manning, like services, like mm -hmm. you don't need to go be the best website builder or the best Shopify, you know, funnel maker or the best ad buyer or the best, uh, you know, creative, like go hustle clients, go cold call, white label other people's services and make your margin in the middle. Oh, you need a website? Great, it's gonna cost you eight grand. Boom, you get paid eight grand, you go pay Jimmy three grand to go build the website <laughs> who does do websites at a high level. Boom, you just made five grand, right? Well, you don't need it, you don't even need 50 grand for that. You need no money for that. You need one grand to go build yourself your own website. You need to, you know, maybe take some courses, understand how to sell and be a salesman. and go hustle and go grind. Like, that's what I would do. You know, like mm -hmm. that's the fiscally responsible decision. And once you have a couple hundred G's, take that same 50, you would have went all in and, and, you know, go in there. My, my, my conjecture to that and my objection to that, not conjecture, my objection to that would be that like, maybe it'll be too late by the time you're there. You know what I mean? Maybe mm -hmm. the opportunity you will, cause like, especially in this, like, it's going to get to a point where it's so big with like these crazy, you know, three grand to 30 million opportunities won't be on the table anymore. You know, so I think it's just based on personality types, understanding who you are. You know what I mean? I'm one of those like, dude, if I lose it all, great. I'll get right back up. I'm the first person at the McDonald's cashier fucking asking for your order. I have no shame. I'll do whatever I need to get what I need to get in life. You know, like I have pride, you know, the P and pudgy penguins does not stand for prideful. I'll tell you that I am not a prideful being. I do not give a fuck. I will literally do what I need to do to climb the ladder. And if that's sitting in front of a McDonald's cashier and asking you for your order, I'll do it. If it's washing your car, I'll do it. If it's walking door to door and selling you a solar system, I will do it. And I'll do it with a big smile on my face. And I'll wake up every morning and I'll do it again. And I'll do it again. And I'll do it again. You know, so I think it's just really understanding your personality type. Who are you as an individual? Who are you as a human being? What's your risk tolerance? What are you capable of doing? Are you a technical mind? Do you understand trading? Like, does that, or does that look like alien shit to you? You know what I mean? Like if, it, you know, some people just don't have the brains built for certain things. I have, I'm sure I'm telling you my brain's built, not built for a lot of things, you know? So I think it's really dependent on who you are and finding, you know, what it is. If you're a go-getter, you're a hustler. I just gave you the roadmap, go drop service and business, some services, whatever that may be. Uh, you know, if you're more of a technical mind, you know, maybe go trade and NFTs and, you know, there's a plethora of different things that you can do. I think the answer is really catered to who you are as an individual, but that's what I would do if it, if it was me and I only had 50 grand. Sick. Damn. <laughs> yeah, bro. I Damn. like that. Cause that, I remember when we were talking about that, Jonathan, I, I also was kind of like, yeah, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. Like, you know, right. I don't want to tell anybody what to do. Cause everyone's different. Some people are super risk averse. And if they spent that all on like fucking Solana, they would be, you know, trembling at that thought. And like, <laughs> that's totally fine. You know, like everyone's a little bit different. So uh, that's me, that man. You, you recognize that. <laughs> that's me for sure. Whenever you were mentioning that you'd be willing to go back to like, you know, stage one to build back up and, you know, do it with a smile. I think, you know, what that sounds like to me, I was thinking of like, as you're saying it, I'm like, what, what, what word is that? And for me, it's like, it's grit, right? Like you have this like grit of like, I'm going to make it happen. It doesn't matter. Was there like, how did you develop that grit? Was it something you're just like, oh, out of the gate had, or was it something your, your parents taught you and, you know, you just saw them doing it? Like, how, how did you kind of start working that grit muscle? It, it's grit, it's perseverance and resilience. And I think it just leans into, you know, this is why I think you find kids who grow up in shitty situations, you know, really coming out on top. Now, I do think that, you know, kids who do grow up in good situations, that actually still have drive and motivation may have a higher upside, right? Because they have more resources at their disposal. But I think, you know, zero to a million, you really find that, you know, the kids that have really struggled in life get there quicker because of exactly what you just said. It's grit, resilience, perseverance. It's like, dude, it's like, I can't fail. I come from nothing, dude. I come from pissing in bottles when I was 16. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> sleeping in a, in a oven, in an oven of a room you know, in Los Angeles on a hundred degree weather days, like I, like what else, what else is there? You know, everything else that's not that as a plus. So for me, it's just like, I've been through so much worse. Like I could, you know, I, not even go into the stories of my childhood, like that didn't break me. So you think this little shit's going to break me? No way, Jose. And that's where I think <laughs> you'll find like a, 
a lot of the, the, the kids who've really been through it have that unique advantage. Now, don't get me wrong, like no one can control the situation they're born into. And I think, you know, rich kids are even more capable of being successful. The thing is they lack, they lack that tenacity, right? They lack that grit and that perseverance and that resilience because life has always been easy. So when life gets tough, it's an uncomfortable situation. It's not unique. It's, it's unique to them. You know, like they haven't been in that, like, dude, I've been, I've been seeing my mom cry and get beaten when I was seven. You know what I mean? Like, I, I like, dude, like this, this is a walk in the park for me, you know, like this, this is, this is nothing, you know? So like, for me, like, this is like, it's almost in my DNA at this point, it's in my bones, it's in my soul, it's in my heart. Like there is no other option other than winning, like failing is not an option, you know? So I think this is, I think this is where you'll find like, there's more success stories. Now I do think becoming a billionaire, if you come from a rich family and, you know, you have a great education, like, you know, the, where the, where the young, you know, poor kid falls short is really in that financial literacy and those like real big connections that can take you to that next level. So if you do find a rich kid that has that grit and that perseverance and that resilience, like embedded in them, regardless of their environment, then their upside, I think, is exponentially higher because those main friction points that like maybe somebody like me, like I'm raising money right now. Where do I, I don't, I can't call my dad and be like, yo, bro, it connected me with, you know, Goldman Sachs and Jimmy Joe at fucking, you know, Morgan Stanley. I need, you know, $10 million. Like I want to take this thing to the moon. A rich kid make that call as dad makes the call and it's, it's done. It's, it's fairly easy. You get in the rooms, you make the meetings and the raise is pretty easy you know, a poor kid, it's like, you know, once you start taking it to the next level, it's like, you know, I've never been somebody who raised money. You know what I mean? I've always done it by myself. I never needed your money. And now is the unique situation where I do need, you know, funds to go compete with the best because I want to be number one. And so then that's when you kind of fall into those barriers where it's like, ah, shit, I wish I did have a rich dad that could just make the call and, you know, make it a little bit easy for me. So I think, you know, uh, I think it's easier to be go from zero to a million as a poor kid because I think those type of traits, you know, uh, that type of grit and resilience and perseverance that you have growing up, uh, you know, dealing with life in general really sets you up for that type of success. Uh, but I do think, you know, maybe 10 million to a billion is more in favor of the rich kid who can figure it out. Yeah. A hundred percent. You know, I, I think, uh, that perspective of looking at like the moments that you had when you were younger and looking to at that, like challenge then versus what you're dealing with now, it kind of, it fails, uh, to have a good comparison. Um, one of the things that I think about for myself is when I'm trying to think about perspective is, you know, when I'm 80 years old, looking back at this moment or like even 10 years from now, who do I want to be when you're looking back when you're 80 years old and kind of reflecting back, you know, 10 years from now, like, let's just say you're 35. Who, who does that Luke, uh, Luca look like? Like, what's the, what's the goal going to end up being? Yeah, dude, I, I just want to be somebody like when I'm 35, dude, I want to be speaking to kids, dude. I just want to like, I remember like, you know, my situation is unique. Cause like I was the kid skateboarding and smoking weed, but I was also the kid who got like straight A's in high school. You know, like I, I always, like, I, I, I was like, I just want to talk to them. You know, I feel like I can impact them. I feel like I can touch them in a way that other people can't. I've always had a really good finger on the pulse on young entrepreneurs and just young people in general. And like, I will always be a kid at heart. Like that's, that's my whole thing. Like, I, I don't know, dude, I just, I just want to like, I want to see, make people smile. I want to help animals. I, I want to do shit that like fulfills me to my core, you know, like, I don't know. If, I don't know if, uh, I don't know. It's interesting. Cause I think Pudgy Penguin has been the first business that actually is like becoming somewhat fulfilling. I think every business that oh, I've been a part of somewhat is before hasn't been fulfilling. Like as much money as I've made, will I really say that they fulfilled me and really made me happy? Like I'll, I'll talk to some of these kids in these, com in this community and kids, uh, sorry for saying kids. Cause a lot of these guys are older than me, but I'll talk to some of these guys and gals in the community. And I'm just like, dude, that's just like, this makes me happy. Like, this is dope. Like some of my greatest achievements is, and people will knock me for it. And then I know like these, like my trading group or, you know, Nets commerce, like, they'll shit on it. Like, Oh yeah. Look at you. Why are you doing that? Like, bro, you know how many kids I've made millionaires? Like, you know, like, dude, I'm up there with the most, like there are so many people who have come out of my little groups that are filthy rich because of them. Like that makes me so much more happy than any, you know, Von Dutch, you know, sales and like all this money that we've made like that, that to me, like that's so much cooler. Cause like, dude, I've had, 
had 15 year olds come to me, show me half a million dollar screenshots. Like, bro, you did this. Like, if it wasn't for your group, like I wouldn't have gotten this. And I'm like, yes, bro. Yes. You know, like, that's what I want to do. I want to fucking impact people. I want to change lives. Like I want people to tell their kids like, yo, if I'd never met this Luca Nets or heard of this Luca Nets, we would not be here living this life right now. Like, that's what matters to me, dude. You know, especially in this age, like I could only imagine like, dude, I was so lost and so frustrated growing up. I wish there was somebody like me that I could look up to and that could like guide me in the right direction. You know, like, mm -hmm. dude, I wish we had that. And thank God now we have all these discords and these telegrams and all these places like these young kids can now like they have such a greater advantage than I did and that we did growing up. Like, dude, there is so much more information when we right. grew up. We had, you know, nothing like we had we had some social media, not to say nothing like we were early, but like we were in an interesting moment in time where we were like, we were early, but we were too young to really monopolize off of being early. Now, some people did, but most didn't. Um, and so it's just like, dude, I, I, I just want to be the guy that like, when it's all said and done, like, like when that time comes and I leave this earth, like people are just like actually upset that like, oh shit, he's, he's gone, dude. Like, you know, mm -hmm. but, but thankful he was here, you know, like it's legacy yeah. dude. at the end of the day, it might be ego driven. Sure. And I totally admit that it probably is, you know, but like it, it's what sends chills down my spine. It what makes me feel full. It's what makes me put my back up straight when I walk into a room. I'm proud of that. You know, like, sure, it's ego driven. Great. But like, that's what makes me feel good about myself. Did I buy like a Rolls Royce and these nice watches and these cars and think, like, dude, this shit does not fucking make me feel good. That Rolls Royce was the worst thing I ever bought. <laughs> and I keep making these decisions. <laughs> I keep making and I keep learning. I keep, I knew the Rolls Royce would be a stupid decision. I knew it, dude. I knew Why was it. it a stupid decision? I did it because I did it because I have two cars and I needed one for work. And I'm saying this just in case the IRS is looking, but I need it for work, you know, and like right, right. it's tax right off. It's a 6,000 pound car. So I justified it, you know, but like, dude, like, fuck, man, I wish I could just live in a world where I can go get like a fucking Ford F-150 and feel good about myself. And for some reason I can't, like, I don't know why they, I still have these underlying insecurities. Cause like, i always feel like I have something to prove to my, to other people. Like I'm rich. Like I grew up so poor and so embarrassed of the situation that I had growing up that like, now I'm trying to be like, yes, I got it. And I want to show people that I've got it. And I want people to look in through the window and see who's driving that half a million dollar piece of junk. You know what I mean? Like I want people <laughs> like, but it's insecurity, bro. It still stems. And it's probably like the, my last form of evolution that I really need to lean into. Like I need to get rid of these insecurities. Cause even to this day, even speaking to you, like just because I'm, I've, I've analyzed the problem, but I haven't solved it yet. I'm mm -hmm. still not confident enough with myself where I can like drive a, a, like a regular car. And like, you know what I mean? Like, I still feel like I have to show people up that like that girl that rejected me back in high school, like, look at this, my ex that cheated on me in high school. Like, yeah, look at that. Now what, who's, what, what's your boyfriend driving now? Mm -hmm. You know, right. I'm still trying to rub it in people's faces that like wronged me in the past. And it's like such an unhealthy habit that like I'm learning it the hard way. This is a half a million dollar lesson. I yeah. hate this car, dude. This car sucks. It sucks. <laughs> Damn. Terrible car. Well, I'm glad that you can see that though. Like, it, I mean, this is the classic saying, bro, but like the first step to fixing anything is like admitting there's a problem. So yep. that's huge, bro. And I like, I, I, I struggle with that so too. much for that. Like, for sure. That, I did not expect to hear that in this podcast. I've never talked to you personally, like aside yeah. from DMs and shit. So it's hard to really judge like someone's character off of that, but that speaks volumes to me. And I think that's like, that's such a good message to spread, bro. Like, I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's tough and you're going to learn the hard way, you know, and mm -hmm. people will listen and people will listen to me be like, yo, I fucking feel you. And they'll still go buy the R8 and they'll still oh, go yeah. buy the Ferrari and the Huracan and whatever. And it's just like, it's fun. Like, don't get me wrong. Like it's, I mean, the Rolls Royce is not fun. Like, the, the, like you know the fast cars can be fun yeah they're cool. like dude, it's pointless you know what i mean like at a, at a certain point it's like what are you gonna do go fast around a corner and then what you're gonna go like rest in peace hamas ha -ha you know he was in the e-commerce community and he was somebody who was an acquaintance but like one of his problems he, him and i talked about it was like dude he was always trying to prove to people and it's like who yeah. are you trying to prove and then he got this fucking Gallardo with fucking old ass Gallardo that like literally like flooring shit in streets. He's not supposed to be flooring it. And now look at him. He's not on this planet to enjoy it with us and rest yeah. in peace him. And, you know, I've talked to you about this because I've had these conversations with him. I knew I knew his shortcomings. I knew, dude, he, he 
be the first one to tell you if you really talk to him that he was insecure. You know what I mean? He, he totally did not come off that way though, right? You big macho man, you know what I mean? With all the ladies and the nice car. But I'm telling you, I knew who that person really was, you know? And he felt like he could open up to me and like, dude, he was, you know what I mean? And look where that got him. You know what I mean? Having a girl in his passenger seat and flooring the fucking Gallardo a hundred and something miles an hour on a street he's not supposed to be doing. That's where that gets you, you know? That's where that shit gets you, dude. And like, yeah. thank God, the reason why I got the Rolls Royce truck and not something else was because I was tired of going fast. I knew my destiny was written like Hamas is in some capacity. I knew it, dude. I knew it. Like I was going way too fast, like way too fast in streets. I wasn't supposed to be going fast on living life like I couldn't die at any split second. You know, the more I get older and every day that goes by, the more I realize like, oh, shit, you know, this is one day closer to my judgment day, you know, like the time will come. Like I want to appreciate it and I want to spend the rest of this time healthy and living and maneuvering the right way. Like, I don't want to be like, and it's not even my life. Like imagine I hit some little kid, you know, imagine I'm, dude, I'm going fucking 140 and fucking side streets, dude. Like imagine some little kid and I take their life. Like, dude, what? Because what? Cause I wanted to impress the girl in my passenger seat. Most girls look at that shit and they're like, that's lame. You know, and I didn't realize that, but the little boy in me is just like plagued, you know, in my yeah, mind. Yeah, they don't know. They don't know. But like the, the girl that you want is going to look at that and be like, you're a loser. And they're going like, to be like, bro, I, chill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A, 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 an immature girl, a girl who hasn't been like, you know what I mean? Maybe like a, like a 18, 19, 20 year old chick. Like, okay. Like who's like all in the Miami nightlife. Oh, wow. I'm so fun. You know, but like, like, you know, the, the girl you really want looks at that and is like, dude, you're a loser. Like, that's not cool. You know, right. and like, I, I, I'm also one of those guys, like, I can't have that power on my foot without using it. So I was just like, dude, I gotta get something slow, but I got this piece of trap. I feel you, bro. That's, <laughs> that's a big thing. I mean, I've, I feel like I have a similar issue when it comes to like, I don't know, for example, like weed, I, I like smoking weed. It's nice. Yeah. And like, it's fucking amazing, but I have periods of time where I'm trying to lock in, just be like clear headed. So I just don't buy weed. Like if I have it, I'll probably use it, you know? So I know right. if it's in my power, like it'll be done <laughs> for lack of a better me, word me and the weed if it's right there i'm gonna smoke if it's not it's 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 discipline right like yeah. life success is a is a game of discipline the most successful people are the most disciplined unless you got lucky but right you said that the like that one of the next things that you need to conquer is insecurity and obviously throughout your journey, you've had to conquer like many of these like self-doubt or, you know, whatever it is, there's many things that you have to conquer. Is there like a certain way that you go about doing that? Dude, I think it's just learning the hard way for me. Unfortunately, I'm like, if I took my own advice, I'd be the most loved, wealthiest human on the planet. But the issue yeah. is, is I know exactly what to do and how to do it, but you just got to learn the hard way. You've got to feel the pain, you know, mm -hmm. like, I think this Rolls Royce was my last straw. Like the pain, it's a half a million dollar pain. And I'm not sitting on a hundred million dollars where a half a million dollars, not a lot of money to me, dude. Like half a million bucks is a lot of fucking coin, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, dude, like this thing was such a disaster that I'm just like, yeah, never again, dude. Like I, I got to learn the hard way. Like when I was younger, I had saved up all my money and I had a bundle of cash, right? And I kept all my money in cash because it made me feel good. But I knew I was like, oh, that's pretty stupid because like, I could lose this money. Someone could break into the home and rob us for this money. Like my right. friends knew that this money existed. I had people come into my house to walk my dog, you know, in the neighborhood. It was just a very stupid decision to have your entire net worth and a bundle of cash in your shoebox. I knew that was retarded until one day it had took somebody to actually steal the money for me to fucking feel the pain to realize oh, that holding God. cash was retarded you know, and to actually never hold bundles of cash ever again, you know? <laughs> so like, you just gotta sometimes just, I'm unfortunately positioned that I just have to learn the hard way. And I don't know, like- I'm How'd stuck. they steal it? It was the, it was, it's the stupidest thing you've ever heard and bridges to another insecurity, but it was me basically hanging out with some, it was the first time I ever hung out with any influencers. I was like, 18 and i was like they were like huge i was like this was like cameron dallas days and like la like that whole little pretty boy group like took over the internet and like one of them hit me up was like yo like let's hang out i heard like good things about you like you're super young and motivated like let's go to dinner so we went to dinner and i took all my money with me i was like i'm gonna fall and i'm gonna show them really what and that's what you had right yeah and so i literally some fucking elite pickpocketer 
literally at the restaurant while I had my wallet on the table, just fucking swipe me, dude, with all my chain, with all my coin. Wow. Dude. Real, real big bozo insecure shit, right? And then there you go. Happens again. I, I feel like we all go through it though, man. I, I, I definitely have gone through that experience as an entrepreneur where, you know, you're, you're trying to flex the money or you're trying to show off that you've done well because, you know, so many people doubt you throughout the process that you want to prove it. But, you know, I think getting rid of that insecurity is one of the more difficult things, but it often slows us down quite a bit. Oh, dude, it's a huge, it's a huge barrier. And I think I'm, I'm slowly, but surely it's like being content, you know, finding a girl that you like, you know, I have a girlfriend, you know, like finally just like not trying to improve the Joneses. And it's like, do you find out like so many of these guys with all this nice shit, like that's all they've got. Like they are fucking penny pension. They are struggling. Yeah, They're they spent month it all. A month. They spend it. And it's like, dude, that is not a good habit to get into. Like that is a means to an end and you will get crushed, you know? So anybody who's frugal, like truly frugal, I like super respect it. I'm like, dude, you've got my utmost respect. Like, I don't know about the absurdities of like doing the whole like Mark Zuckerberg, like one bedroom apartment being worth 30 billion, like, you know what I mean? Driving a Hyundai, like, I don't know about all that, you know, that's like, I think, <laughs> yeah, it's a little extreme, you know, don't get me wrong, but like, you know, who am I to say that? You know what I mean? I'm the fool buying half a million dollar trucks. You know what I mean? That's a, that's a, that, that, you know, you, you buy half a million dollar trucks when it's not, when it's less than single digits of your net worth. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right. Like when it's like fractions of a point, that's when you go buy a half a million dollar truck. That thing is not fractions of my net worth, dude. That thing is like points. You know what I mean? <laughs> of what I have, like it's multiple points, you know, like to go spend that on a depreciating fucking clunker. No way, dude. The car sucks. <laughs> that's so funny, man. Car sucks. Uh, how are we doing on time, Ari? I, I have a couple more questions, but I don't want to. Yeah, go, I mean, time. honestly, I'm. I'm having a blast, man. This is like a great time. These are probably one of my favorite podcasts so far. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're very intriguing, Luca. You got you got a little bit more time? Yeah, yeah, I got. Uh, give us uh, 23 more minutes is my max out. Sick. Okay. So um, I, I have questions about marketing and then also religion. Are you cool if we dig into religion at all? all right. Yeah, go, go, go ahead. You cool with that too? Okay. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, all right, cool. So, um, you know, with the, with the Scott Hilsey podcast, I, I watched the first one, I watched the second one. There was a pretty drastic difference between the two. Um, and I believe you started the last one with, or the last one I saw with a prayer out of the gate. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was surprised to see it. And honestly, I loved it because you, it was such a, a pattern interrupt from what you typically see in a, in a podcast. And I was like, okay, you know, like this is a pretty substantial change from who you were previously. What are your thoughts on religion at the moment? And like, how, how do you kind of like, look at that for your career as a whole and how you kind of carry yourself yeah so during that time i reverted to islam and i say reverting because the prophet muhammad says that everybody's born islamic they just choose a different path so you know i reverted to islam at the time and since then i've kind of diverted away from that path not because i don't love the religion and i don't resonate with it fully i felt like i couldn't respect it enough to declare myself a muslim right so like, I think a lot of people quantify themselves and identify themselves in a certain religion, but I think it's offensive to the people who really practice that practice to identify themselves as, you know, a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew and not really take it seriously. And the problem was, is I wasn't following, you know, the, the book to the way you were supposed to like follow it. And I felt like I was insulting, you know, devout Muslims who really devote their lives to this. And so it's like being a Christian and just having sex every weekend with a different girl. You know, in reality, a Christian's not supposed to have sex until he's married. You know, he or she is married. Like that's in the book. And right. sure, you can have mistakes, but it's one thing to make a mistake, and there's one and there's one thing to make a conscious mistake. So right, so an unconscious mistake is like, okay, geez, I was in the car with a chick, she just started whatever, and we had sex, unfortunately, and like, I'm sorry, God, I repent for my sins. Another is scrolling on Tinder and saying, I'm going to go smash and go have sex tonight, you know, and willingly actively pursue it. And, you know, that's not a mistake. That's an action. And, you know, it's offensive to people who really practice the Christian religion, like, like really follow it. You know what I mean? Like, and, and so for me, it was like identifying as Islam and me not praying to Mecca five times a day and like me not doing what like most Islamic people do. I just felt like I was disrespecting their culture and I didn't want to represent them in that manner. So I kind of backed off and my stance is really as follows. Whether you're a Christian, Jew, Muslim, whatever you want to identify with, 
or if you're a spiritual person and believe in energies, whatever you want to quantify your God, we all believe in the same God, the same person who created each and every one of us. The semantics on how the journey and how the story is told is up for conjecture, but every book, you know, says the same thing that God loves you. God wants you to believe in him and, or her or it. And, you know, God wants you to make a positive impact on the world. That narrative is same across every religion. And anybody who tells you otherwise has not read the books. And I can tell you I've read all three. And I've had really smart people. And I've talked to really smart people about this subject. It's the narrative is the same across the board. How you misinterpret things is up to you. But the point is, is every religion has a God that loves you, that cares about you, that wants you to care about him or her or it and wants you to help people like that's the same narrative you know what i mean help your people and so for me like that is my god right that that person that's and, and and is it an alien is it you know somebody that sits in in heaven who dictates it is it zeus is it you know an energy is it you know the cosmos and the stars and the sun and you know gray matter like it doesn't matter to me but there's something greater at play. And I really believe in that. Mm -hmm. And whatever that resonates with you is important. I am definitely not somebody who religion shames or, you know, I think everybody should accept their values for what they're what they are. I like to judge people based on their integrity and based on my interactions with them and, you know, how they interact. I've met plenty of Christian people who were not nice to me. I've met plenty of Jewish people who are not nice to me. You know what I mean? And that's what matters to me, right? Like that's it's how you interact and what are the interactions that I have with you is how I'm going to judge you. And I think everybody should take the same approach. It doesn't matter what religion, we're all one people, we're all one human species, one human race. Uh, and our objective in life is to make this world a better place, at least better, at least better than when we first came into it and if we all you know followed that ethos i feel like the world would be better and uh, hopefully it's not about which side you're on because it's not about sides it never was and never will be we cut take off our skin and we all bleed red and we all have the same you know heart and lungs and brain and you know whether you might look a little bit different than i doesn't really matter and it never will matter to me and as long as you believe in making a positive impact and you know, leading with love and care, then that's, that's what matters to me. Like everything else is a subject of change. And so if you believe in spirits and, you know, and, you know, ghosts and whatever, it doesn't matter. I, I believe in all of that. Like all of that can be real. At the end of the day, you ask any great scientific scholar, how much we know about science, and they won't say a number greater than 10%. As a human species, we know about 10% of science and so to disprove God or any greater being than us, you need to know 100% of science because science is what you're going to use to disprove, you know, God or to disprove ghosts or to disprove parallel universes. But because we don't know about science, you can't conclusively disprove any of these things. So at the end of the day, they're all right and they all matter and they're all, you know, narratives that I can believe in and I can get behind. So I am a man of God, first and foremost, my God can be you know, the alien who's running this simulation up top. It can be the stardust in which we are formed out of, uh, or it could be you know, a man with a beard sitting in the sky and the clouds dictating which decision is made. But to me, I am a man of God and that's what matters to me. Damn, yeah, bro, that, I, I really love that. And the fact is like, if someone thinks something is real like to their core to an extent it is like you just mentioned even like in quantum physics that's that's how it is like schrodinger's cat or whatever like the positioning of particles it's all right like they're all correct you know so arguing over you know whose god is right i think is such a waste of like human potential such a waste when the underlying message across the board is the same and rather than bickering with one another and fighting over things that don't matter, why don't we just push the human race forward and be one? And that's just so silly to me. And I don't know how people can think otherwise, but hey, that's one of the paradigm shifts that I hope over the course of my life I can influence and I can change. And hopefully Hell more yeah. people start thinking like me. Or if they don't, fantastic. But as long as they're not hurting people, then it doesn't matter to me either which way. I feel like, you know, as I'm hearing you, you know, uh, talk about these things, one of the things that I feel like is pretty apparent to me that you care a lot about people, um, but you also, it seems like you care quite a bit about building relationships with people. Um, 
I mean, obviously there's massive benefit to that in uh, business. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about like building like personal relationships and business relationships? Do you think it's something that people should focus on if they're trying to build a business or become better? Um, like what are the thoughts around who you surround yourself by? 90% of my money has been made by relationships. If I look back at every dollar I've made, 10% of it was made by my fingers and my computer making things happen. And the other 90% was built by relationships, whether that was a relationship of somebody telling me to buy something before it popped off or somebody, you know, helping run the business or bridging a huge partnership that made me millions of dollars. It right. all starts with relationships and I will always value EQ over IQ. And for those of you guys who don't know, you know, your intelligence is measured in two ways, your IQ, which is your intellectual intelligence, right? Like what your brain capacity is and you can take tests for that. And one that is a little bit harder to measure, which is your EQ, which is your, basically your emotional quotient, how you interact with people and how you build relationships. And I've seen a lot of people with bird brain level IQ make tens of millions of dollars because their EQ is so high. And I'm one of those. Now I don't have bird brain level IQ, but I have a really high EQ. And that's where I think I've made a majority of my money. And I've quantified that in the form of 90%. And that's where I feel like I'm strong. So many opportunities, dude, that I've literally, bridged because of just how I've been able to interact with people. And don't get me wrong, some of the brightest minds in the world have super low EQ and super high IQ. I think, um, you know, a lot of these tech minds and a lot of these traders are up there with that. But for me, my strong shoot suit is how I interact with people. And I will continue to leverage that. And that to me was a huge backbone of my success and will continue to be until the day I die. Yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that, um, you know, when I look back at, you know, my business career so far, um, it, it, a lot of what I've been able to uh, build so far has been really based on relationships. One person connecting me to another person, a referral, or um, even just hearing and learning a lesson from somebody else and, and being able to experience it secondhand as somebody's building a business, I feel like is uh, one of the uh, superpowers that not a lot of people lean into. Uh, you know, for for you looking back on your career, obviously you've uh, been in business a while and one of the strongest suits that you have is marketing uh, and being able to get people to you know fight for products because they love it and they they hear so much about it um, how do you think about trying to spark a little bit of momentum behind a product is there like a framework that you follow is there certain things that need to get integrated like controversy or anything like that yeah i think you know Having a successful business that's built around the product starts with one thing and one thing only. It's product integrity. Do people want the product and is the product good? And I think you guys will find that a lot of businesses have taken off because somebody just was in the right place at the right time with the right product. And I think that's really it. There's no crazy marketing strategy. I can tell you a playbook and there's definitely like, I have a little playbook for clothes and how I go about marketing a clothing business, but the clothes is redundant if you don't have pieces that people want. I think it all stems back to product market fit. And if you have a product that people want, it will work. And if you don't, it won't. So one thing that I was really stuck on and I learned early on was stop trying to push products that people do not want. The second I touched a gel blaster, I knew this would be the biggest thing ever, right? And it made my job fairly easy. I mean, I take credit for it and I still will. But at the end of the day, if the product <laughs> wasn't so good, you know what I mean? The thing would have failed. I put that in people's hands and people want to play with it because it's better than Nerf. It's better than paintball and airsoft in the respect that you're not going to completely murder yourself if you get slapped with one, you know, and right. it's a better mousetrap of the three. So it's one of those things where it's like, you know, Von Dutch was easy. Again, like I credit to my playbook, but at the end of the day, the designs were fire. The logo is fire. The product is fire. So at the end of the day, all I needed was my touch. So beyond anything, it's product integrity. Like people try and get so emotional and attached to certain products. And that's what crushes them. They just keep trying to beat a dead horse, beat a dead horse. It's like, dude, like the reason why I got into Pudgy is because I knew the product was so fire. They just needed some operational experience. Mm -hmm. Like you don't trade that much volume with no leadership and no utility. If the product is not fire, the art is fire. Whether you disagree with it or not, whether you like it or not, it doesn't really matter to me. It's personal preference at the end of the day. Numbers do not lie. You know, and when I bought this thing, it traded hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, you know, so like 
what are you going to say? Like, <laughs> that's great. You know, like it, it, it clearly is magical to people, you know, whether you agree with it or not, or whether you resonate with it or not, it doesn't matter because other people do. And as long as other people do, I knew, okay, well, look, this is the same playbook with Von Dutch, the same playbook with Joe Blaster, the exact same playbook. Yeah. Take something that resonates with people and blow it out of the fucking stratosphere. It's what I do best. So I knew coming into this, people resonated with the penguins. So blow it out the fucking water, which is what I'm going to do. Bro, can I, I ask it. you something a little, uh, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but when you bought that, because you just mentioned Pudgy Penguins, for example, like, you know, they've done hundreds of millions or hundred million, whatever, in ETH. You bought it for 2.5 mil. That's like, what the fuck? Fire. That's crazy. Uh, does that, the person that you bought that from, um, I know who it is, but do they still get a percentage of the equity of the, of the IP or you bought it like fully? 100%. Took, completely took it off their hands. It was good for them. It was it was a fire sale for me. It was a great deal for me, and I basically got them out of a peculiar situation that they didn't want to be in anymore. So yeah. great. Wow. Well, that's that's a great place to wrap it up, man. Again, I'm. This was just amazing, bro. I'm so happy to have gotten to know you like more personally. This is awesome, and I'm I'm looking forward to continuing to nurture a relationship here. I really am. Yeah. Likewise. Other than the Scott Hilsey podcast, this is definitely my third favorite one. So wow. uh, <laughs> that's thank huge. you, thank you for giving me something that I actually enjoy doing. And Fuck yeah. uh, I've done some other podcasts and some other interviews since the Scott Hilsey's one. And other, I think a Rabs was pretty fun to do, but I really enjoyed this one. You guys came correct in your setup. And so it was really enjoyable. Awesome. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Well, peace out everybody.